I'm Gavin Robert. This is Albertina Albers Lawrence. Um, we're going to be teaching a, a course on international merger control in the Lent term. Um, I've practiced in the area of competition law and in particular merger control for over 20 years. I've been a partner at Linklater's, the international law firm, for more than 14 years. Um, I'm currently also a member of the UK Competition Authority, the new authority that was set up um, earlier this year, the Competition and Markets Authority, so I actually decide on merger cases as well as part of my uh, uh, profession. Um, and I'm actually passionate about the subject of um, international merger control and looking forward to telling you a lot more about it. Before I do so, let, I'll let Albertina briefly introduce herself as well. Thank you. So my name is Albertina Albert Lawrence, and I'm a university senior lecturer, and a fellow and a director of studies at St John's College in Cambridge. I've been in Cambridge for the past 20 years, and uh, I've been teaching uh, in the LLM competition course for many, many years. I enjoyed it enormously. Um, and um, I have to say that last year was the first time that this uh, international merger control module ran in the MCL. My role is very much a supporting role because Mr. Robert is the main lecturer, but I can say it was a privilege to be able to attend all his lectures and to work alongside the students really. You could see how much uh, they gain in terms of understanding over the course of um, last year's sessions. And it's really a, a tremendously interesting course, and I'm really very much looking forward to doing the same this year and to getting to know all of you a little bit better. So thank you. Thank you. So I think the idea is that between Albertina and myself, we have a very good blend of practitioner and academic. Uh, credentials to be able to deliver a course for you that um, exactly meets the needs. So what is international merger control? Well, it's the um, control of mergers and acquisitions that take place around the world by competition authorities. So it is an element of competition law and when two parties agree a merger or a major acquisition, that merger or acquisition may well need to be notified to various competition authorities around the world or may be subject to review by those competition authorities to decide whether the merger or, or acquisition or joint venture should go ahead. And they'll take that decision largely on competition grounds as to whether the um, merger will damage competition or whether it will be neutral or in fact be beneficial for competition. And you'll have seen plenty of examples of that in the newspapers every year, almost every week. Um, there are discussions, if we think, over the last few years, there have been a number of very high-profile mergers which have even been blocked by competition authorities around the world. I can think of the, the proposed merger between the two um, postal companies, UPS and TNT, got blocked by the European Commission when they couldn't agree suitable remedies or divestments. Ryanair has been trying to take over the Irish airline Aer Lingus for many years and has actually had three attempts and has been blocked each time by the competition authorities. And then we saw uh, a couple of years ago Deutsche Post um, attempted up a, a acquisition, sorry, Deutsche Börse's um, attempted acquisition of the New York Stock Exchange which also got blocked by the European Commission. So the point is that if you are advising on mergers and acquisitions, particularly global mergers and acquisitions, but also domestic ones or any cross-border deal, you really need to understand the risks involved in competition law and risks involved in merger control. Now, the theme of the course is international merger control, and I have to say, if I look at my practice, how it's developed over the last 25 years, it started off as doing UK cases, then more and more doing European cases. I then ended up doing five years secondment to, to Brussels, um, and from then on, my practice developed as more Europe-wide. But actually, over the last 10 to 15 years, it's become really genuinely global in nature. 
and as a lawyer primarily based in London, I've been increasingly advising on deals anywhere around the world, particularly on the European um, uh, aspects of those deals, but actually really trying to understand what's going on in the US and South America and increasingly in Asia. And over the last five to ten, last five or six years, I've been particularly focused on China. And one of the things I've been doing is developing Linklater's Chinese competition practice. But actually, as a lawyer, I've been advising and helping clients understand how the system in China is now evolving. And I sincerely believe that actually China is fast becoming the third pillar of um, competition law and international merger control in the world alongside the US and Europe. And we'll be focusing quite a lot on those three major jurisdictions as well as a few other jurisdictions in Europe. And I mean, I'm actually flying to China tonight and we'll be meeting with Mofcom in Beijing um, uh, at the end of this week to talk about um, their system of merger control and how that's evolving. So actually understanding all those systems is important. But I'm also conscious we mustn't just skim over the top and try and look at too many systems around the world. So we very much base the course on European merger control. That's where we get our depth. Four out of eight of the sessions are very much focused on European merger control. But we use that also as a benchmark for comparing other systems around the world. We do then have one specific lecture on US merger control, where my um, uh, partner, a uh, former partner, I used to be a partner, he still is a partner, at uh, Linklater's in New York, will be flying over to give that lecture himself, and he is really uh, an expert and an incredibly good speaker. Um, we saw last year a very animated um, seminar he gave on US merger control. And then I will personally give the Chinese a separate session on Chinese merger control as well. Um, it is also, as a course, I think one of the attractions of it, and it may also be, uh, I've tried to convince you not to be afraid of it, but it is quite unique in terms of the different courses that you'll be following on this module. And, the, and if you've not done competition law before, um, to some of the other law courses, because although there is law and it is a legal course, it's actually quite a unique blend of different disciplines. In particular, it's a unique blend of law and economics and to some extent politics. And the economics angle of it, you mustn't be frightened of it. I am not an economist. I have never, never formally studied <coughs> economics. I have spent a lot of my career, though, talking with economists to try and assess what the impact of a merger will be on competition, whether it will result in an increase in price. And how you measure those things and understand those things is an economic question. And how lawyers understand economics is a really very interesting subject. You don't have to be an economist to understand those theories of economics. And what we do is we dip our toe into a particular area of economics called industrial organization economics. And I think, certainly as far as my career has been concerned, it's been one of the most rewarding aspects is actually getting to grips with some of that. It gives, it's quite refreshing, it's very different. You don't have to be a mathematical genius, I can assure you, because I tell you my daughter's, she's 11 and her maths at school is beginning to get beyond my uh, mathematical uh, talents. But I can still get to grips with the eco economics that we get to grips with. But also, there's an element of politics and understanding the political influences behind merger control. There's a lot of allegations that decisions are politically influenced, particularly in China, but also in other parts of the world. In the US, we get allegations in Europe. And understanding to what extent politics can be taken into account and what the safeguards are <laughs> with any merger control system to withstand that, that political pressure. And we saw it very much actually in the UK earlier this year with Pfizer's attempted takeover of AstraZeneca, a lot of political pressure around that deal and a lot of people looking at the competition law system to actually block the merger on political grounds. And that's very also understanding the institutional setup and structures which, um, which uh, influence those kind of decisions and to what extent we need to make sure that those decisions are not um, uh, influenced by, by some of those short-term political goals. 
So the other thing that we will be doing is making the course very interactive. So we will try, I will try and bring in wherever I can my experience from actual cases I've been dealing with. And actually to give that some formality, we will actually do some case studies um, uh, revolving around live cases. So for example, we will talk about um, jurisdiction. To what extent, when is a merger subject to the jurisdiction of a particular um, regime of a particular country or region? And we will be looking as an example at the iron ore joint venture attempted by Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton, which was the largest industrial joint venture the world has seen, or attempt, at least attempted, because in the end it didn't happen, where I advised Rio Tinto on the global competitional aspects of it. And it's a very good example of some of the jurisdictional issues that a global joint venture of that nature um, gives rise to. When we look at procedure, and procedure is very important in this area, we'll look at um, uh, different statistics around the world as to um, how uh, those mergers are dealt with in different regimes. When we come to look at substantive assessment as to how do you decide whether a merger results in an increase in price or is damaging to consumers or competition, We'll look at some case studies from live cases that I've been dealing with. We'll be asking the question, which came out of Smith Klein Beecham's acquisition of the Sensodyne toothpaste brand, to what extent is there a separate market for sensitive toothpaste? Or is sensitive toothpaste part of a larger market for all toothpaste? And if you're trying to bring together two sensitive toothpaste brands, that is the killer question. Then, for example, I don't know if any of you have seen um, the sitcom The Office um, with Ricky Gervais, which um, I think has been broadcast in different countries around the world. Well, that actually takes place in an office of paper merchants, which is not the most exciting business in the world, and it's not supposed to be. But actually, we will look. I looked at actually a very interesting paper merchant merger, and we will be looking at some of the actual evidence that we looked at in that merger in terms of the prices that were charged by paper merchants and the volumes and the contract different, we've anonymized it, but you'll have exactly the same evidence that I had and the regulator had to decide whether the merger will um, um, give rise to an increase in price and whether after the merger they'll be more likely to get together and collude um, because of the increase in concentration. And then when Tom McGrath comes over to talk about US merger control, he'll focus in particular on the, what is quite a famous merger in the States um, involving Whole Foods and Wild Oats, two organic food stores. And we'll be looking at the question to what extent do organic food stores compete with large grocery chains. And um, obviously if they do compete, then the merger would not be much of a problem but if it's a separate market, then they have very high market shares in that separate market. So hopefully, using case studies will have um, will give it some colour and a lot of interest in class as we, as we go through these, some of these questions. So the seminar takes place, I think, every Thursday morning between ten and twelve. Um, if we, one of the first things we'll do is see if we can squeeze in an extra seminar for. To, to, to try and consolidate towards the exam to give you a chance to revise and have a look at um, past exam questions. And we'll, we'll try and do that for you if we can. It's optional, you don't have to come. Um, the reading list is, um, is already on the website. There's no textbook for this course. Um, there are plenty of textbooks and chapters and textbooks that are recommended. You certainly do not have to read all of them. I've recommended as many as possible, so there will always be one on the shelf. Um, uh, so you can you, you know, just read one or two and some articles. And there's quite a lot of legislative guidance published by the Commis European Commission. And the European Commission's website and the guidance in that website is actually one of the more interesting um, places to look. Um, there's also a couple of introductory books about asking the big questions, what's competition law all about? And um, there's a couple of uh, textbooks I put on the, re uh, on the reading list, which are not so much textbooks, are just sort of more interesting uh, uh, books um, about uh, what competition law means and what its objectives are. And just to say, some people may never have studied competition law before, and I'm aiming it 
so that there is a level playing field between a couple of you who may have studied it, and, but most of you won't have, and the first lecture on the course is an introductory lecture to give everyone the same building block. So don't be worried if you've never done competition law before. Um, as to the exam, last year it was a closed book exam, and I got so many complaints and moans about it that um, we have given in to all of that and we've made it open, um, open book. Um, so there's no concern about that. There'll be um, a choice of three questions um, out of five in the exam with no restrictions on which questions to choose. Okay, any, any questions?